The centuries report Zulus to the southwest. Thousands of them. The Battle of Rourke's Drift, probably the most famous British battle of the Victorian era. The 22nd of January 1879, about 150 British defenders surrounded and attacked by over 4,000 Zulu warriors. 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded to the defenders for their actions that day. One of them was to this man, Private Henry Hook of the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot. I would argue he's probably the most famous British private soldier of the era, possibly in history. Why? Well, because of the film Zulu, of course. Yep, you remember, he was the bad lad who liked to drink and abuse his comrades. Come on, Howard, put your money up. Are you gone stupid? What bloody good you think it'll do you if you do win? Well, I'm sure many of you know that the real hooky was nothing like that. In fact, he was a damn good soldier. So much of his background is vague and so many myths have sprung up that author Neil Thornton has decided to write a new book about him that finally gets to the bottom of the man and his part in the battle. In today's episode, we're going to learn why Henry Hook joined the army in the first place and what sort of personal life he had. Then we're going to examine blow by blow his part defending the hospital at Rourke's Drift. It's fascinating stuff and we'll be using diagrams to show his every move. Oh, and stay tuned until the end to learn if his wife really had married someone else while he was in South Africa and how his family really reacted to his portrayal in the film Zulu. Anyway, enough from me. Let's get stuck in with Neil. So this is shortly after Rourke's Drift and that is the man you're looking at who was at Rourke's Drift, you know. Later on, quite soon after he left the army, he, he did pile on a little bit of, bit of timber and it's probably the only image I, th I think that I've seen that you know that shows him his life prior to Rourke's Drift or prior to joining the army. Very, very normal, very you know average working class lad from Gloucestershire. So he married quite young, um, had a couple of a couple of children. Now reasons for joining. It's not set in stone, but it, it's it's a huge possibility. So years later, after Rourke's Drift, he got his marriage dissolved, and it came out in the hearing, in the sort of in in this proceedings that his wife had 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 an affair. So it was alleged at the time, you know, as as this came about, Hook accused her. But he, he knew the dates, the, you know, the, the days, the dates, where it was. He knew all the specifics. So if something had gone on there. He named the person. Um, so it's quite detailed. This happened, well, two weeks, to in a period between two weeks and a month prior to him joining up and listing. Now, is that a coincidence? Hmm. If it is, it's a good one. So, Neil, moving on then. So, he's joined the army. He's en ended up in the 24th. He goes over to South Africa. We all know he's, uh, well, he's one of two things, right? He's either a sort of ne'er-do-well troublemaker, as per the film, or he's this, you know, very godly uh, teetotaler. What have you found out? What, what is the truth of this? Yeah, so, uh, obviously, the film portrayal, he uh, couldn't keep his hands off the drink, even mid-battle. Mid he opens <laughs> up a cabinet and has a swig. You deserved it, don't get me wrong, <laughs> in that portrayal. So, yeah, it's the, it's the opposite. You know, it, it's quite um, widely known, you know, that he was a teetotaler, he didn't drink. But one thing I will I will mention, and it's worth highlighting, he wasn't actually teetotal throughout his life. He wasn't a lay preacher, which is often mentioned. Nothing, nothing like that. So he took the pledge when he arrived in South Africa. He went through the Cape, Cape War, Ninth Cape. He took a pledge not to drink whilst in South Africa. You can bet you bet your life he was drinking before he got there and no doubt he was drinking after, he was drinking after, you know? So he wasn't a lifelong teetotal. He didn't have to think, I will not touch alcohol. He went to all the smoking concerts and drink, you know, with the with the uh, volunteers later. So um, teetotal whilst in South Africa, although there is evidence to suggest that he may have broke that pledge at least once after the, the Battle of Rock's Drift, and you can't blame the lad for this. There was, uh, they were issuing out the rum ration at the end. I think it was in the Natal Witness. It was in one of the Natal papers. There was an account of it. Uh, and the sergeant, the issuing sergeant was actually surprised to see him lining up for his for his top and, and said, oh, you, do, do you want some? And could he use, oh, he used to give his, his, his ration away to the others. And he said, I think he will after that lot. And who can blame him? Well, let's crack on with the details of the battle. Here's a drone shot of the hospital building today, but let's hear what it was like on the day of the battle. 
a dreadful place to defend would be a, uh, to sum up in a nutshell. Horrible, horrible place to defend. The rooms did not really interconnect a lot. A lot of them. The front area was all opened up into a, onto a veranda. The area in front of that building was lost by the defenders. They withdrew their their um, perimeter, you know, the wall they were holding. So that area was open. Most of the battle to, to the Zulus, who were trying the best to get in through the front there. This is at the now, top of the screen, screen uh, where there's like a veranda. Top of the screen. Exactly, exactly. So it runs, it runs out. Yeah, there's the uh, the mealy bag um, barricade in front of it. There was a little bit of a sort of um, well, there's two sections. You can see there, one section was was deemed too vulnerable, and they sort of um, built a second one behind it in case anybody's wondering why it looks a little bit bit odd there. Yeah, when they were building it, they, I think they just basically thought, well, this this juts out, it's too exposed because they were trying to follow the ground, you know, the ground that sort of slopes up. But it was just too precarious, I think. And um, it was probably charred. He, he, he did say that he made some tactical adjustments to the perimeter. Um, so it was sort of, um, yeah, it was a really horrible position to hold in front of the hospital. But the hospital itself, we turn into that. Yeah, really, really stuffy, small rooms, not interconnecting. Uh, Char did recommend that they knock through the walls, or mouse holing, as he called it. That wasn't done, probably due to time, or possibly... The guys didn't think it, it was worth it, but as we will see, um, yeah, it would have been beneficial if he did do that prior to the battle. But you know, the time and everything else, it, it didn't it didn't happen. Yeah. So yeah, there, there was this three three rooms to the left of the hospital. Uh, Hook was in the sort of the bottom left bottom left room. So for those who can, can see it, there that you'll see the, the dots. These uh, depict. The allocated defenders of the hospital. Now there were other people in there. There were there were patients uh, who could pick up a rifle and defend themselves. There were other patients, bedridden, fever ridden, Maxfield for one, Sergeant Maxfield, you may recall him from the film, completely um, you know delirious, couldn't uh, assist in the defence. So Cole is in the bottom left there. Cole is with um, Hook, Private Cole. Who it said in Washington of the Spears was claustrophobic and ran out early on um, before the, the fight took place. That's There's no evidence for that. So I'll, I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt um, and say that, you know, the, disregard that, that notion. Hook and Cole, bottom left. Above them in the middle room to the left, probably the worst place in the entire defence, including outside, is that room. They've got one external door. They've got no um, internal door. Uh, and the Zulus came from the bottom of the screen. They swept around the left. But, you know, th their position there is getting the full hit. Particularly when, there's, when the British retired from this front of the hospital to behind what we call the dog-like barricade, because that was what Penn Simmons referred to it as, which linked up the North Wall with the hospital. Like a little dog leg. They threw that up quickly outside when they fell back. So this area, this side of the hospital is really, really exposed. Horrible place, like, like you say. Um, and most of the patients in that room would actually be, be killed later on. John Williams would, would knock through the wall and link up with Hook. So that's that's this in a nutshell. We've got the, um, the other two two guys uh, towards the, you know the bottom right of the screen, uh, and this is Robert Williams, uh, sorry Robert Jones and um, William Jones, and they're covering a sort of T-shaped room if you like. The two rooms are, are interlinked, joined. And they're in there with a number of patients as well. So between the Joneses and Hook, there's two rooms. The one next to Hook was manned, and there was quite a few patients in there, which Hook ultimately and um, John Williams would drag through the holes and, and save. But there's also another room there you can see with an external uh, door, no internal door, and that was not manned by anybody because there was just literally no point to put men in there. Uh, no internal um, doors. They had the Joneses covering this corner. They had Hook and Cole covering the other corner. They had a number of patients in the room next to it. They didn't need rifles there. They had rifles covering that wall. Whereas if we look at the Williamses, there was nobody else really covering that wall. Cole was covering a loophole in the room with Hook. They needed rifles, to, you know, to bring to bear on that that side. So. It was a really terrible position, but it was needed. So that's that's the start of that's where they started the the action. These six uh, allocated defenders, who, by the way, 
were allocated. Uh, you know, it's often said that they volunteered. They didn't volunteer. They were placed there. Uh, it can't be a coincidence that the Joneses and the Williams were placed together. You know, if you look on the roll, there was probably four or five Joneses and Williamses on, and these two, on both occasions, alphabetically they are next to each other on the roll. On the, you know, so they were literally just pointed out, placed in there by Bourne. Uh, Bromhead dictated we need people in there. Hook was the hospital cook, so he was brewing up for the patients. He was serving them their, their, their you know, their food, etc. Again, that was just on a rotor, probably like a month at a time. Hitch, again, who's next to him on the on the roster. Uh, Hitch was doing the same job, but for B Company outside. And it was just their turn. If you look at the role, it was their turn. They're next to each other, and they, they just moved down the role. Hook was best positioned. He, he knew the hospital. He was in there serving the, the patients prior to the battle. So he made it made perfect sense for him to defend the place. Cole, from what I can tell, completely random. You know, there's no uh, reason why he, he was placed in there. So I must assume it was just random. Yeah, so there's a little bit going on here. So we've got um, Cole has, has already exited the building. He's ran out the front and he was killed. Uh, he was shot through the head, actually. Um, that was, yeah, he ran out to, to join the battle outside. Um, we've got, so we start in Hook's corner room. We can see that Hook has now moved back to the doorway, internal doorway. We've got one guy has ran out of the, the room above. There's a star, and that depicts um, Joseph Williams, a allotted defender, or allocated defender. He's now been killed. So he's either ran out or been dragged out of that room whilst that was going on. Uh, a couple of others were killed in there as well. Um, John Williams, that is when he decides, right, we should knock through this wall. So he knocks through his wall. He moves back in with Hook into the room next to the bottom corner room. So now we've got Henry Hook. We've got John Williams paired up with a team. Yeah. Um, Hook's holding the door. He's holding the doorway. Um, there was a native in there that was left behind, a friendly native, wounded uh, earlier in the campaign. Um, yeah, he, he he was sort of shouting to be taken with them, but he he died. When the Julus came in, they you know Hook heard them questioning him, and then he was stabbed lying on his bed. He couldn't move; he, his leg was all bandaged up and everything else. Uh, now, one discrepancy is that Hook said he he was forced out of that room through through smoke because the roof was set on fire. Now. It was set on fire, but I think maybe um, there were other reasons, potentially, because he did describe the Zulus entering that room later on, which he couldn't have done if it, if it was, um, you know, if, if it was full of smoke. The Zulus then killed this native. Hook held the door. And now in another account, he did say that he was having trouble with his rifle. He was jamming a lot, and he was in there by himself. There was two loopholes because Cole had gone, and the pressure was just too much for him. Completely understandable when you've got Zulu swarming around the place, you've got two loopholes, and you've got a room next to you with more fighting men, more patients that can fight in there. Yeah. Much, much safer place to be. So Hook's, Hook's back there holding the door. We've got John Williams runs through, and instantly he starts smashing through the next partition along the along this bottom south side of the building. And would he be using um, his bayonet for that, or did he still have that pickaxe that they were allocated earlier? Yeah. So there's a there's a pick. So when they were actually prepping the place for defence, uh, Reynolds prepped it with a lot of the pay, the patients. They uh, sealed up the windows and they actually described using a pick. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think the film depicted uh, the, the bayonets. Um, it was a pick. It was a pick out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he's soon through. You know, he's soon through there. Uh, although I, I don't think it would have felt like it was quick <laughs> because Hooks, me and my Hooks fighting the Zulus off in the doorway. And he does describe, actually, in one of his earlier accounts, fighting over the soles of his boots in blood. Uh, and he describes, actually, yeah, he, you know, he doesn't go into that much gory detail in his later accounts. But in one of his earlier ones, that is how he describes it. And he says, actually, that um, he built a barricade. He, so probably both of these doors, you know, there's the two doors that he's got, one into the corner room, one into the front. And we have got, by the way, guys at the, holding the front of the building who then start making individual runs for, for freedom. Some make it, some don't, some hide, you know, till the morning. Uh, but Hook, Hook then starts barricading these doors, building an almost like a barrier. So um, and included in that barricade were five or six dead Zulus. He said he piled them on top of each other until the barricade was shoulder height. 
and he used that as a barricade to, to hold the Zulus back with his bayonet and with his rifle. But yeah, certainly he was holding that door for a, for a prolonged time. Uh, he had a few near misses there. I mean, he, he was wounded, actually. Is this where uh, he got hit in the through. helmet? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I don't know if the helmet possibly saved his, potentially saved his life, because that seems to have taken the brunt, the, the, you know, the, the brunt of it, took the force, uh, and it then sort of come down and wounded his scalp. Now, it's often said that a lot of the images show that scar. There's no evidence for that. Uh, we know that Hook did say that it left a scar. Whether or not that is actually the scar that we see or a part in later on, you know, we don't know. But he did say it left a scar. It didn't trouble him much at the time. As you can imagine, he's full of adrenaline. He's got better things to think about. Um, but he did say, and there is evidence, or quite a lot of evidence to say, that it really bothered him. It gave him a lot of trouble in later life. You know, he, he was in bed. He, he had time off at the museum where he used to work in the British Museum. He was lying in bed with doctors tending to him with, with severe head, headaches. Pretend, you know, I, I would assume this could potentially be, be linked to this. He certainly thought it was. So, um, so yeah, very, very um, close close shave there. But he um, he just continued, you know, while John Williams was knocking through the, the bottom. So, meanwhile, we've got, and this is a sort of, this is a really big, big thing. Um, I, I covered this in a book I wrote about Rourke's Drift, and it's, it's now, thankfully, it's sort of the accepted theory. Uh, and it had just been missed, you know, along the way because the accounts are confusing. But there was actually two separate evacuations from the hospital, from this bottom, from this window where you see the arrows. Um, the Joneses evacuated before Hawk and Williams had got through, broke through to them. So it was two stages that yeah. this happened. I'll break all this down. I show evidence. It's all in in, in a previous book. Yeah. I won't go into it now because we'll be on for a long, long time going through that. <laughs> Fair but, enough. But, um, but, but yeah, yeah, so um, the Joneses evacuated with their patients through that window. You can see them coming out. That was after they'd held the door. The, the Zulus had, had broke through. Um, Sergeant Maxfield was killed in the in that room. Well, uh, Robert Jones did try to get him out, but, but couldn't. Uh, and they hopped out of that window across this yard, which, for, for, for those listening now, was abandoned. Uh, if you can see, if those that can see the image, they jumped out into this, what I call the main yard. That area had been retracted. So the main defence had moved further away to another sort of section. This is a no man's land outside. This is a no man's land. They're jumping out into a, into a yard, which is completely empty. And the, the guys outside are giving them some covering fire. And they're running across, carrying, dragging, helping patients as they go. Meanwhile, We've got Hook, we've got Williams still fighting in their section of the building, uh, and they're knocking through the walls. Now, once once Williams is through to this this room, which it wasn't manned, the one next to you know sort of the bottom middle room, yeah, that was barricaded from the outside. Uh, there was nobody in it, so they broke through to there. Now there is um, suggestions. Hook says that most of us got through that room. He doesn't say all of us got through. He says most of us got through. Now one or two patients were killed here. I suspect. Jenkins, one of them, tried to make a run from one of these doors at the bottom and was killed. Uh, but they never all, they didn't all get through. But uh, yeah, details are a little bit hazy there. So, so Hook is now, as as Williams breaks through to this unmanned room, he then breaks through again. He enters the T-shaped large room that's open at the end. Um, he takes all the patients with him. Apart from one, and we can now see on the screen, is blue in blue. So that's Private Connolly. Now, Connolly's leg was absolutely knackered. He fell from a wagon, caught his leg as he fell, and basically ripped his kneecap out of the socket. Um, excruciating. Um, and he couldn't move unaided. And when he did move, with the aid of Hook, you know, you can imagine the agony and the screams. So he was actually shouting for Hook not to leave him. The rest of the patients are through. You can see Williams is knocking through into the end room with his patients. Hook is still holding that doorway, and he's looking back. He's fighting. He's looking back. He's looking for a, for a, his his opportunity. And as soon as Williams is through, he runs back when he gets a minute, rips Connolly off his bed, uh, drags him through this hole in the wall, uh, and then Hook now has the same job of holding that hole in the wall, while the rest of the, while Williams gets the rest of the guys 
to the window and out the window. There we go, that's it exactly. So you can see the movements there. So Hawk drags Connolly through into that bottom room. He drags him again through to the next one. Williams and the, and the patients are, are gone. And Hook is now alone in the hospital. I mean, this must have been the most scariest time. You do read a lot of accounts um, through all eras, through all wars, and people actually say, you know, the most, uh, the time I was most scared was when I was sort of by myself. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, Hook was with Connolly, but Connolly was, was was couldn't contribute in any way, and he was a burden. He wasn't a, a help. Um, so everyone else is gone, and Hook's there by himself now. As we know. Hook somehow got him out. Again, unclear how. The accounts differ, and this is all covered in the book. There are discrepancies. Connolly gives... He's caused me some headaches because <laughs> his accounts are really, really different. In one account, he says he piled mealy bags up and got out of a, a small window. So with his leg, maybe he couldn't get out of this big window. Was there another window? He says he crawled into a bush and hid there till the morning before he got into the defence. In another account, he says... He got out, went into the main defence and then used his rifle from the storehouse for the rest of the battle. There's no sense to why these accounts differ so much, but they do. Yeah. Uh, and Hook, Hook do as well, you know. Uh, I mean, Hook in one of his earlier accounts actually says um, that he carried you know, all of the patients, seven patients, out of the building to safety. Now, he didn't do that. But is this a mistake from the person who's writing it down? he was illiterate and illiterate and he was verbally giving his accounts was it misconstrued along the way you know we've got to take these things into account he didn't personally carry them all he personally carried Connolly, and he, he he held the door while while uh, williams got the patients out it's a difficult thing to piece together you know and and where we can't piece it together we have to hold our hands up and say we just don't know you know um but that is what, what i've explained now we know that 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 happened yeah, uh, and that's the way it went down. Yeah, a quick question. Well, well, well earned VT. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, a, a quick question I had, Neil, and you may or may not know the answer to this, or maybe it's a silly question. But so we've got the T-shaped room. Obviously, the, yep. as you explained, there was like essentially two groups, and the first guys had already gone out the window when when uh, when Hook and his party came through. Were there then Zulus inside the T-shaped room that they had to battle their way through to get to the window at this point, or we're not quite clear? Yeah, that, that's a that's a, that's a great question, actually. So the war, the, the were Zulus in there at one point. So along this along this south wall, um, once the Joneses had retired, they jumped out the window and gone. Uh, or as this was, was going on, um, Robert Jones has a, a really good account of this. He, he actually says that he was holding the door and they forced the way in as William Jones was getting the patients out. And he shouted through to William Jones, said, the Zulus are up, up on us or the Zulus are on top of us. William Jones came running back and they held that door at the point of the bayonet. Um, they then were getting the patients out. Um, Robert Jones was the last man out. Now, Maxfield, as we know, was left in that room. He was delirious. He, he couldn't get him out. Robert Jones actually ran back to try to get him. But as he ran back through, he saw, he saw that Zulus were stabbing him in his bed. Um, and that, that was how he was killed. Now, obviously, Zulus were in there at that point. But the rest of the men are out the window, across the yard, gone. Now, the Zulus don't seem to have remained in there. They seem to have come out. And they. And when we say Zulus, we're not talking hundreds. You know, we're talking handfuls, small groups. Yeah. Uh, they, then, they then seem to have come back along the south wall and potentially they've gone up into Hook's corner room and attacked, Hook, or attacked through Hook there, through that, through that door. Because others, others were doing that. Um, or maybe they've come through into the room held by the Williamses originally. Uh, the, you know, the sort of top left corner and work the way in through that way. But um, they were really busy as well setting fire to the place because when the Williamses, um, one was killed, one fell back, that sort of top corner area is where the fire started because the resistance had crumbled at that point and there was nothing to stop them doing that. So that's where the fire started. Um, so, yeah, the, the, answer, the answer is there was Zulus in there um, at some point. But there's no reference to, to them being in there when when them guys come through. Or, you know, potentially this is where Hook says, you know, they, they got through and most of us got through. So were the Zulus, were, were these lads dragged out and killed? Um, frustratingly, we don't know. And this is what makes the historian's job so difficult, isn't it? You know, conflicting accounts, yeah. 
you know, the fact is not, you know, we will we'll probably never know, but uh, you've done a bloody good job of piece, yeah. piecing together what we can learn. So let's fast forward a little bit then. So obviously, you know, famously, we've, we've now, you've now spoken about his marital issues. You know, famously went home, found his wife for uh, allegedly thought he was dead and then married someone else. Is that kind of how it went down? And then could you give us a sort of brief overview of his, his life after, after leaving South Africa? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in a in a, well, in a word, no. <laughs> um, he didn't get home to find his wife and ran off with somebody else and remarried. That's just, um, yeah, let's quell that one, that myth. Um, look at the census reports. Look at the look at the um, you know birth, marriage, deaths. It's all there. It's all there. Um, his wife was still living at their home address. Um, Hook never returned to that address. She was still married, by the way. She was still down as married on the census reports. It's a, it's a hook, <laughs> I might add. Um, so, no, no, she never remarried. Uh, now, she'd apparently sold off all the possessions. I've heard this, not through any solid evidence, but I've heard this through, it's come through family. Um, so, they knew that the, the wedding, uh, sorry, the wedding, that the marriage was clearly over. Clearly. And both, both parties knew this. Hook when he came back, he went straight to his mum and dad's house, and that was that. Uh, now, his wife did remarry, but it wasn't until many, many years later. Hook, at that time, was in London, working in the museum. Um, he did remarry. Now, they were still married, which is why Hook then took steps to get their marriage dissolved, because his wife had gone and remarried. So, there is, there's all, the, things just get twisted and, and sort of, um, yeah, slurred along the way. Yeah, she did. So you can't say you can't say that she went off and remarried, I guess, because they were still married. But at the time, it wasn't during the Rock's Drift period. It was years later. Um, so that's it's a it's a myth that that happened. Um, Hook, by the way, went and as soon as their marriage marriage was dissolved, he married within two months. He was married again to Ada. Who there we go. There's Ada. So Ada was, was his wife right up until his, his death. One thing as well, so he does like, he, here's Ada, they have two daughters. Um, this can't be a coincidence. His first daughter was Victoria Catherine, so VC. It, it, his working life after after the, um, you know, he came back, he got a job with like a local doctor for a little while. His, his father died. Um, his mum remarried, moved away. Hook moved to, to London. Uh, and he gets a job working for a, a, a contractor, a big building for, building firm that uh, supplies contractors around London. Now, they supplied the British Museum with contractors, which is where he went to work um, as, a, as a duster. Now, he wasn't taken on by the museum staff. They have their own staff, and then they have contractors. But Hook wanted to work for the museum. It was less money, slightly less money, because the contractors were on a little bit more. But they enjoyed job security. Right. So you were seeking on the museum, you've got a job, you know, contractor, it's never, it's never, you know, there's always a question mark there. So Hook pushed for this. Now, you needed to be educated or at least you, you had to be literate. Hook wasn't. Um, it could have been a stumbling block, but Chelmsford wrote, wrote to the museum when asked for a reference and he gave a glowing reference. Nice. Um, and Bromhead wrote a reference as well. Now, going back to Chelmsford, now, when he spoke to Hook at Rourke's Drift, immediately after the battle, Hook said he absolutely stuffed it, stuffed his words, didn't know what to say, was mumbling, because he asked for an account of what he'd done. He was just so nervous and, you know, probably a little bit, bit worn out after his day's uh, exertions, <laughs> As you would one be. could imagine. Yeah, he said that he just sort of didn't make any sense to Chelmsford, but Chelmsford took a shine to him, you know, and he actually promised him there and then on the spot, if there's anything ever I can do for you, you only need to ask and I'll be there. Nice. He promised him that. Uh, and true to his word, you know, he, he, he contacted the museum to sort of, um, it was a different title at the time, but the equivalent to today's director of the museum. Um, yeah, he, he, I think Hook owes that job to, to Chelmsford and to Bromer, you know. Um, and he, he did sort of say, Hook, that he, I will learn to read and write. Now, I don't think he didn't really do that. Uh, and we know later when he could sign his name, we see documents, whereas earlier on he was, he was just an ex, you know, on his, on his first wedding, um, he just signed an ex. Um, he makes some progress, but uh, pretty much throughout his whole life, he, he, he was illiterate, but he got the job, he got this job. Um, one, probably it helped he was a VC recipient, and two, Chelmsford and Bromhead 
uh, delivered the goods and helped helped him out. Um, so that's pretty much him in a nutshell for his career. It was very, very ordinary. Uh, as this front of house man, everyone saw him, everybody spoke to him, asked him about Rourke's drift. He, he became very, you know, uh, his accounts flowed. He was giving these accounts all the time. And that's why we've got so many. You know, he, he there's no other Rourke's drift defender who left more accounts than Hook. Yeah. And that's because people come into the museum and asking him about it. There was reporters, there was magazines, all kinds of different people. Um, he did. He did serve, by the way, in, in volunteer units or Middlesex, etc. Um, throughout his life as well. So he carried on his army, the interest in the army, in the military. So Neil, obviously, long time after uh, Hook's death, we get the film Zulu made. He's obviously portrayed as a badden, and famously, the family walk out at the premiere. Now, you'll tell me if that's true or not. We've got this picture of them there. What can you tell us? Who are the, who are these guys, and what really happened? Okay, so the, these are, uh, well, they've got dignitaries. This is at the cinema in, in Gloucester, the premiere uh, in Gloucester. Members of Huck's family, uh, including his daughter, uh, Letitia uh, Jean. She went by either name according to the newspapers, although she was known as, as Letitia. So third from right, dark-haired lady. Doesn't look particularly impressed, I don't think, with the film. Um, she was like a um, defender of her father's reputation, if you like. You know, she strove to, to sort of restore his reputation. She wasn't happy with the portrayal at all. But she did go to more than one premiere. So did the whole family. And um, going to your question, returning to your question about them storming out. Well, they're there afterwards. I don't know if they stormed out or not, but it doesn't look like it. There's no account of any of the family storming out of the cinema. Um, is this a story that's just evolved and grown legs? Now, I spoke in depth with Sheldon Hall about this. If anybody knows, it's Sheldon, um, author of Zulu with some guts behind it. He does not believe it happened for one minute. I have spoke to various people, well, dozens of people. Um, I've looked through all the old newspapers, all the old film reviews, everything I can find, Not a, nothing. Uh, Ian Knight, I can reel off probably a dozen serious historians. No one has found one single shred of evidence. So all I can say is, as far as I'm concerned, it didn't happen unless something comes to light it didn't it didn't happen uh now don't get me wrong they were not happy they were not happy one bit now um she did write a very strongly letter worded letter strongly worded letter to the production team and actually to james booth as well who played hook in the film uh and they sent him a portrait photograph of the real hook yeah and to his, to his credit, he actually put that up, framed it, put it up in his, in his hall, and it remained there his whole life. He had a picture up of the real hook. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, from what we know, I think we think it's just a myth. Uh, almost certainly it's, it is just a myth. If you enjoyed that episode, please share it with others, and please comment below to let me know what other great stories from British military history you'd like me to cover.